Good evening. Okay, just got a few items here before we get going. Uh, remember our spiritual growth seminar uh, begins Sunday. Uh, Keith Parker will be here, be speaking to us Sunday through Wednesday on that. Uh, some little flyers are out there in the foyer if you want to pick one of those up. Some uh, updates, uh, Kathy Slayton's dad has surgery next Thursday and then uh, he'll have radiation uh, to follow that afterward. So need to remember him in your prayers. Also, uh, remember uh, Mel's family, her brother Alvin Leach passed away uh, recently. His funeral was today. And uh, so I uh, just need to remember that family. And also uh, the Page family, uh, Mike's mom, Rako, passed away a Sunday, and her funeral was today also. So I need to remember those families. Joan Cook had eye surgery, and everything went well with that. And I have a note here that Lou Ellen. Uh, Goins is ill and is asking for prayer, so we need to remember her also. Uh, does anybody else have any more updates other than that? songs of praise unto thy name and hear thy word. Lord, we have many that have people that are sick, some have lost loved ones. Ask you to be with those families. Be with the families that are still struggling with this terrible disease. Pray that it will soon go away. Be thy will. We ask that you be with us and ask you to be mindful of thee in all things. We pray that our Mark the invitation song that's for after uh, Adam's lesson. It'll be 347, 347, Jesus is calling. Then when you have that marked, turn to 595, 595. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high its royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall be lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet hope obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye better men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will fail you, ye care not trust your own. Put on the gospel armor, and watching unto prayer, where duty calls for danger, be never wanting there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, 
The strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor song. To him that overcometh, a crown of life shall be. shall reign eternally. Good evening. Good evening. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 66. Psalm 66. This is one that I was uh, reading this afternoon. Uh, the uh, funeral uh, graveside was running a little bit late, and so I said, you know what? Let's just pop out our, my Bible and, and read a little bit while I'm waiting. So uh, I came across this one, and uh, I think it's, it's a pretty meaningful psalm. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4. It says, Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. When I was reading this, it reminded me of a song we often sing in our hymnals called, Come We That Love the Lord. The second verse is uh, kind of an interesting uh, stanza. It says, Let those who refuse to sing, who never knew our God... And, it's always an interesting uh, one to sing because you kind of look around and see if anyone's not singing. Thinking, oh, that's a little harsh, right? <laughs> to say they never knew God. Then it continues, but children of the heavenly king, but children of the heavenly king may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys abroad. When we are children of the king, we speak our joys abroad. We tell other people how great the Lord is. We sing praises to him as we have done so tonight and will continue to do here in just a moment. We shout for joy as the psalm says. We give praise to his glorious name by, by telling other people how much God has done for us. And so at, at first it kind of seems a little harsh to say those who refuse to sing never knew God. But I think in the, the process of, of looking at this psalm we can say you know, if someone really did know God, if someone really did know how awesome his deeds were, then they would be singing, right? Amen. In fact, the only part of God's creation that doesn't worship him is us, right? We as human beings, it's because we forget how great our God is, how awesome are his <clears throat> deeds, how glorious his name truly is. And so as we go about our week, let's continue to sing. Let's continue to shout for joy to the Lord. Let us continue to sing praises to his name, to tell other people of his deeds. Because we are children of the heavenly king, and we speak his joys of pride because he has been so good to each one of us. So let me just have that encouragement for you as you go about your week, to have joy in your heart over what God has done for you, and to tell that to other people who are around you. Uh, if you have any need tonight, we would love to serve you whether that's coming to Christ for the first time or, or asking for help in your journey with Christ. If you have any need, please come forward as we stand and sing this invitation song. Jesus is calling, calling, calling. Jesus is calling today. Why should I linger, linger? Yeah. 
Well, uh, we talked about gratitude for what God has done for us and gratitude for how he blesses us. And, and John just wanted to say a few words just to thank the church for how good uh, you all have been to him throughout time, but especially here recently. And things that seem, seem to be getting on track for him and Christina. And, and uh, he's going to say a few words and then I'm going to say a prayer for him. When I get through this, that busting up, y'all, I'm a real muscle person and special right now. I fell in my face a little bit. I thought my church was mad at me. I got scared. I was embarrassed. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know what to do. I thought everybody turned back on me. But I knew I was wrong. I hear every one of y'all's prayers. I've got every one of them. God's answered every one of them. And I thank everyone y'all from the top of my heart. I love y'all from my heart. I'm sorry if I've caused any embarrassment or anything to anybody here, but I love y'all from my heart. And that's it. Thank you, brother. Right, let's bow together. Dear God, our Father, we're thankful, Lord, for, for John, Christina, and their faith in you. We know, Lord, they've been struggling in a lot of different ways recently, and, and uh, we're just thankful, Lord, that uh, they put one foot in front of the other, and um, things that seem to be looking up for them, and uh, we pray, Lord, that you'll just keep them uh, strong in you as they walk through this life, help them not to get uh, so discouraged with the trials of life, uh, but always let them define joy and peace in you and, and and I'm personally thankful for the way that this church in so many ways has blessed them um, and uh, given to them and, and prayed for them and uh, showed them encouragement um, this is uh, truly a blessing to see the church uh, surround a couple and, and to say um, that we love you and we care about your soul and we want to help you uh, in any way possible thank you Lord for for that example, thank you, Lord, uh, for the blessings to come from your church family. Uh, we pray, Lord, uh, for John and Christina as they head forward. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. are now dismissed to your classes. Good evening. Uh, if you want to, go ahead and turn your Bibles over to uh, Matthew chapter 5. We'll probably start there. Matthew chapter 
I'm going to try to finish up a series of lessons that I started back, I don't even know when it was now, it's been a little while. It seems like every time we get sort of to the point we can get back together, we got to stop for a while or got speakers coming in or, but uh, I started, I did a few lessons um, on how to love one another and uh, just to kind of cover the, the bases again. Uh, we started out the first lesson was was about uh, uh, communicating your needs right we talked about how uh, a lot of the problems that happen in the church sometimes happen because one person thought everybody knew they needed something and they didn't communicate that to everyone and then it didn't get done and people got their feelings hurt and so we talked about how it's not really loving to expect everyone to read your mind right it's not uh, one of the most loving things you can do is, is communicate your needs to, to other people, give them the opportunity to meet them. And then we talked about listening. And, uh, you know, listening is not uh, waiting for your turn to speak. It's, it's actively shutting your brain off and listening to what the people are saying, not thinking about how you're going to reply, but listening to uh, what they have to say and considering it, right? So the series is on on how to love one another and um, tonight we're going to talk about uh, depending on how much time we have we're going to we're gonna start off talking about uh, doing good okay and uh, we're going to start there in Matthew chapter 5 and one thing I think I I talked about this a little bit before uh, in some of the other earlier lessons lessons um, love is uh, more than just a feeling, right? Love's almost always uh, an action. It requires some work on your part. Um, can you feel love for someone or from someone? You can feel it, okay? But it's not really a feeling, not like the Bible defines it. Um, The Bible speaks of love as something that we do, and uh, because love is something that we do, it can be clearly seen through a person's actions. Uh, and by contrast, a lack of love can, can, can clearly be seen through a person's actions, right? Um, when we hear Jesus tell his disciples, love your neighbor as yourself, or to love your enemies, like he does in Matthew chapter 5, what do you think he means by that? be at odds with somebody and you can be right and they can be wrong but you still have to love them right and we said love's not a feeling so and I, and I want to kind of make this clear um, I think of somebody that's that's in a like an abusive relationship you know a, a battered woman or something like that and she she uh, a lot of times has trouble leaving her spouse or getting away from that situation because they believe that their husband loves them, right? Love's not what you say, it's what you do. Um, Thank you. 
going to talk about Saul and David. That's definitely one that we're going to we're going to look at. Um, let's go ahead and look at Matthew chapter five. And uh, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 43 and 44. Really, actually, let's do this. Uh, instead of just 43 and 44, I, w- I want to get a really expanded view of it. Let's, let's back it up to, uh, we'll start in Matthew chapter 30, um, sorry, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Matthew 5, beginning in 38, and I want to read through 46. Matthew chapter 5, verse, verses, beginning in verse uh, 38. You have, heard it, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have, heard it, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For if he makes his son rise on the evil, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and, the, and on the unjust. For if, you, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Um... Adam and I have talked about this before, and I've always kind of wondered, does he really mean this? Do you, do you read that and feel like, I do, I read it, and I'm like, he can't be serious, right? And as far as I can tell, he is. That's uncomfortable, right? But you have to have, uh, I, in my view, the only way you can uh, satisfy get here the action part of it someone strikes your cheek what are you supposed to do you give them the other one if they take your your tunic is your tunic your shirt or your coat one's I can't remember yeah so basically they're saying if they take your coat give them your shirt too right it's about action do you read anywhere in here where it says that you have to have warm fuzzy feelings for the person that's doing that to you (laughs) There's going to be some feelings in there involved in the word love. So and, it, and that's I can't my point. Hate them and act like I love them. Yeah. I can't and give him my shirt and say, "Here's my shirt, you dirty rotten scoundrel." Yeah. So you can, you can do good for people out of love, but not like what they're doing to you. Does that make sense? And that's what he's talking about. He's not saying. I have to really have fond feelings for this person who's abusing me. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying when they do abuse you, uh, overcome it with love. You know, give more than they ask so that you can uh, show them that that the the thing that you're taking away from them or the physical action that you're doing to them that's that's painful or hurtful is nothing compared to the love that how much better things could be if, if you loved one another. Does that, does that make sense? Maybe it's kind of hard to give your folks your shirt and you're standing there shivering and saying, ah, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we got to do something like that. I, I, I want to explore this. Look, go to Matthew chapter 22. We're going to look at it. This is another... That's right. Love's an action, right? It's not. It's not words. It's not what you say. It's maybe not even what you feel. It's 
more about what you do. And that's, that's what we're going to see here. Go to Matthew chapter 22. Uh, let's look at uh, Matthew chapter 22, verses 34, 34 through 39 is what we're going to look for. It goes like this. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is a great commandment in the law? And he, Jesus, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great first commandment. And second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Um, he's pretty clear here that all the law and the prophets hang on the fact that you love God and with, with everything you've got and that you love your neighbor as yourself. One thing I think we're going to see in David's life, and, and, and uh, Adam kind of alluded to it, um, I think there was more than one reason why David didn't kill Saul when he had a chance. But part of it was because David loved God. And Saul was the anointed one of God. Okay? I want to put a question out here for you to think about. We won't answer it just yet, but... What if, what if we could teach ourselves to look at others, friends and enemies both, as the anointed of God? Just think about that for a minute. Uh, like I said, love's a fee is, love is a feeling, and you can feel it. But to see love, it's an action. Uh, here's something to think about our emotions when, we, when you're talking about an emotional thing an emotional response to somebody whether that's love or not our emotions are often tied to our circumstances right uh, not many people are born with the ability to be happy or content when their circumstances are miserable that's a very mature and learned behavior and mindset Look over Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. You guys know this. Verse 11. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am, I am to be content. I, I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all, that, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, which is Christ. You know, when I think about the Apostle Paul's life, um, signed up to be an apostle. Do you think he knew all the stuff that's going to happen to him? No way. He, he goes through it one time. I I, uh, I can't remember where he is. I should have looked it up. But he talks about I was shipwrecked. I was beaten. I was in prison. I was, you know, and it's really would I sign up to be Paul? I don't know. You know, I mean, not if I knew what was going on. I'm probably too chicken for that. Paul says all that stuff that happened to him taught him to be content. No matter what, right? No matter what his circumstances were, he was content. Whether he had plenty or not enough, whether he was in prison or free, he was content because of who? Christ, right? Christ helped him do that. Um, look at 1 Samuel chapter 24. That's what, kind of what Adam was talking about. We're going we're gonna to look at this. And I find this interesting. Uh, Think about all the stuff that Saul did to David. If there was ever a dude in the Bible that deserved a comeuppance, it's Saul, right? David defeated the guy that Saul was afraid to go take on, saved the day. He, he sang songs to him when he was in a bad mood to help him you know, feel better. I mean, everything that David did was not offensive towards Saul whatsoever. Um, Yet Saul threw a spear at him one time and tried to pin him to the wall of the of the of the, t 
tent or whatever it was they were in and hunted him down several times. He, David had to flee for his life, and I mean, it was pretty bad. When you get here to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24, uh, you kind of get this story that, that uh, Adam was talking about. And uh, I don't know if I want to... I'm going to read some of it and then comment a little bit, and then we'll read the rest of it. Beginning there in verse 1, it says, When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Ben-Gedi. And Saul took 3,000, 3,000, not two or three guys, he took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. That was evidently a happening spot that everybody knew about. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the back of the cave, and the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as, it's, as it shall seem good to you. Uh, Saul's dead if, he, if David is not who David is. And it's not that David was averse to killing because he killed a lot of people, right? You look at all the uh, part of the problem that started with, with Saul and David was David was a better warrior than Saul was. And they would go out and talk about how Saul killed his thousands and David killed 10,000, you know. Uh, he, Saul doesn't live here because David's averse to violence. David's a very violent man. Uh, then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. This is the part that gets me. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. After all the stuff that Saul had done to him, it, it amazes me. All he did was cut off a piece of his coat, robe, whatever you want to call it. He just took a piece of his garment, and he felt, and it, it pained him. He thought, man, I can't believe I did this. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should go do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. You know, you can, you can glass over that last little bit and not think a whole lot about it, but one time David was... You know, they were fighting somewhere, and he said, man, I wish I had a drink from, where was the well at? Do you remember, Adam? It was behind enemy lines. It was, it was like, he said, I just wish I had a, a drink. And several of them got up and went and fought their way in just to get a cup of water and bring it back to David. Um, so David's men loved it, and they absolutely wanted to go kill Saul and end this thing right now. And he had to persuade him not to. That was not a that was not an easy thing. Now, what else do we know about David? I don't know how much he loved Saul, Saul. But who did he love? Jonathan, Saul's son. What do you think it would have done to their relationship had he killed Jonathan's father? I kind of wonder about that. David had every right to take vengeance on Saul if he wanted to. I think he loved Jonathan more than than a brother, and, and I think part of the reason why he never would kill Saul is because he knew that he would have to look at his best friend in the whole world and know that he killed his father. But there's another thing there, too, and that's what I was asking about before, This seeing that he's the Lord's anointed. Um, David's respect, maybe fear, it's not just love. I don't think it's just love uh, of God prevented him from seeking vengeance on Saul. And I thought about that a little bit, and I think this ties into the idea of you have to have warm, fuzzy feelings for people to do good for them, to show them love. And I think the answer is no, because you can find the most reprehensible human being there is, 
and they might deserve anything you could do to them. But I don't have the right to, to do anything to them, right? If I can view that person, if I can teach myself to view that person as somebody who God sees value in, then maybe if I don't, even if I can't feel the love in my heart for them, I can do loving things for them out of respect for God. Does that make sense? pretty sure Andrea and Christian, I think you guys were there. I know Andrea was. Uh, one of the most powerful object lessons I've ever seen was uh, uh, Stuart Collins. Came in one day and we had the youth group downstairs. Do you guys remember this? And he had these pieces of paper. And uh, I can't remember, did they write something on the front of it? or maybe it had a picture on a bullseye, I can't remember what it was, but he came in and he told them, he said, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to think the person you dislike the most. Um, somebody that's mistreated you so bad that you'd love to just do anything to get back to them. Of course, the kids are, you know, they didn't have much trouble thinking about things <laughs> like that. And they, I don't know, my picture may have been on one of them. I don't, at the time, I, I couldn't tell you, depending on whether Morgan and I were fighting or not, but uh, and then he gave them darts, and they put them up there, and he said, okay, I want you to throw that dart as hard as you can into that paper. And they did. Boy, they threw it, and I'm pretty sure they hit the wall a couple times, but they did poke a bunch of holes in the paper. And they all kind of laughed, you know, and it was funny. He got done, and he pulled the paper off, and he turned it around, and there was a picture of Jesus. Holes all in it. You guys remember that? Huh? Yeah, I, I'll never forget it, you know. It took 10 minutes to do, but left a la lasting impression on me. And I, and I remember thinking, if I could learn to look at people that I don't like, just like Adam said, as <laughs> Jesus, it's like he said, if, if I do something good for somebody that I don't like, then I've done it for him or somebody that uh, has done something bad to me. Um, there's something here, and I'm not sure I understand it, 100%, but I do know this. I don't have to have warm, fuzzy feelings for somebody to show love for them. But if I respect God and what he's asked me to do, then I do have to act loving towards them. And when I say loving, I mean do good. Okay? Um, <coughs> let's go on back here to verse 8. Afterward, David, David also arose and went out of the cave, and he called after Saul. My lord the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? This day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. For by the fact that I cut off a corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there, is, that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have sinned not against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you. But my hand shall not be against you. Verse 13, as the proverb of the ancient says, Out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? A dead dog after a flea. May the Lord therefore be, be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. Look what happens to Saul. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, 
Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? Now, he wanted to kill him just a few verses before, and now he calls him his son. And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I, I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, and that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he not let him go away safe? So may the Lord reward you with good for what you have done to me this day. And now behold, I know that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut off my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of, the, out of my father's house. And David swore this to Saul. Then Saul went home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. David had a lot of faults, but uh, loving people wasn't one of them. When he loved somebody, he loved them deeply. And you see this later on in his, in his, in his own life with his son Absalom. You know, after all the stuff that Absalom does uh, to humiliate David and try to kill him and take over his kingdom, the one constant thing that you hear David say over again is don't harm Absalom. He wanted, him, he wanted to reconcile with him if he could. He, wanted, he definitely didn't want to see him dead. Joab didn't let that happen. Um, in a lot of the studies I've done on David, several commentators refer to him as a Christ-like figure. In these two... Uh, instances I see a lot of Christ in David right um, turn over to 1st John You guys all know what John 3.16 says, right? Well, this is 1 John 3 and 16. It says this, By this we know love, that he, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for, our bro for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Um, I think that's easy for us to think about for our friends, right? Who doesn't? Is there anybody here that if they had a friend in need would be like, you're all right, you know, you'll, you'll be okay. Most of us would help someone, right? I really see this... Um, as a task when I think about people that have abused me or, or wronged me in some way or wronged somebody I love. I can't tell the difference here. Uh, we're supposed to love everybody and do what we can for them, right? Anybody disagree with that? Yeah, especially the household faith. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. What good are you? Yeah. Do you really have love? Yep. Um, it's an interesting thing. Uh, go back to this here. Um, anytime you see the word love, say any time, a lot of the times. Here's just a few of them. We'll do this. Um, let's go to Galatians chapter 6. I want you to see if you see a pattern here. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 10. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those of the household of faith. Okay? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Let's 
get a little interactive here. Who wants to read that? First, First Thessalonians chapter five, verse uh, fifteen. Second Thessalonians chapter three. In fact, I think I'm I'm going to call uh, <coughs> I'm going to call on uh, Andrew. Have you got that? Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse thirteen. Okay. First Timothy chapter six, verse eighteen. Timothy chapter 6 verse 18 they are to do good to be rich in good works to be generous and ready to share and last let's go to Hebrews chapter 13 Hebrews chapter 13 verse 16 Do not, neglect, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. You notice how many times he says to do good or do? It's not a feeling. Folks, it's, a, it's an action. Right? And, we don't, and we're not supposed to get tired of doing it. Just do good and do good and do some more good and when you run out of things to do good, find something else to do good, right? That's the goal. Maybe harder to say. Look at uh, Luke chapter six. It's kind of a companion. Uh, companion passage the one we read earlier. Luke chapter six, beginning in verse twenty seven. And again, this is Jesus talking here. It says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Verse 32, if you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great you will be sons of the most high for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil be merciful even as your father is merciful what are you supposed to do to somebody who curses you bless them right what do you do for somebody who abuses you pray for them uh, what do you do if somebody wants to borrow from you and you know they can't pay it back? You lend it, right? What he's saying here is that uh, even though doing something for somebody else, can, we talked about how oftentimes your emotions are tied to your circumstances and, and if you help improve somebody's circumstances you can maybe help them be in a more loving mindset that's not really the goal the goal is to do good for somebody and if you improve their circumstances that's good but you're doing the good for somebody because they are valued by God right no 
matter how bad you think they are, God still values them. And how do we know that? Well, he sent his son for all of us, right? Christ died on the cross so that everybody could have a chance to go to heaven. Not just the really good people. Um, this sort of leads into, and I'm going to try to get into it anyways, but you can't do good to somebody. It's hard to do good to somebody if you hold a grudge, right? The second, the last, or the last lesson that, that Wes kind of talks about in this um, series of lessons is to forgive. I heard a guy say, well, I read somewhere, I can't remember. Somebody quoted it and I read it later on. I couldn't tell you. I'm getting a little befuddled sometimes. But he said something along the lines of, Holding a grudge against somebody is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. Right? What's one reason we forgive people? Dennis kind of touched on it a while ago. God wants us to do what's good for us, right? Holding a grudge, uh, holding hard feelings against somebody that's done you wrong um, sets up a very negative way of thinking in your mind that's not good for the rest of your body or, or your spirit. Um, the main thing you've got to do in the is forgive them or you won't be forgiven. Hey, there's something in it for you too, right? Uh, if we refuse to forgive, forgive people, God won't forgive, God won't forgive us, us, right? Um, I'm reminded, and I don't know where it is exactly, uh, but it talks about... Uh, talks about uh, your sins that you have on you can hinder your prayers. you remember where that is, Dennis? I don't either, I, but I know it's there. You, we could probably look it up if we had enough time. I think that one's uh, keep your eyes to your spouse okay. or your prayers. First yeah, Peter. you're right. That, that it is tied to how, it's tied to your uh, marital re relationship, right? And then the idea is there that I take from that is um, not just love your wife and take care of her. The the really strong warning is there how I treat somebody else can hinder my avenue to God, right? Um, we need to forgive people because if we can't forgive them, I can see a situation where it sets up your your prayers being hindered. Because you're holding this grudge on, you know, back here that's bad for you, and you won't let it go. Um, so, kind of like Mamie said, there's something in it for us too. I think also, I mean, I, the way I always try to explain it to my kids growing up is, you, you hold the grudge, they control you. Do you like it or not? So if you want God in control, forget it. Yeah. Because you don't want somebody else controlling you, and God can control. You. And that's a good point. Um, when you allow somebody, when you hold a grudge against somebody else, you know what happens a lot of times? I've, I've seen this, people that have held a grudge and, they, and they, they, they held on to it for a long time. You know what? When you finally get those two people together in a room and, and get them to discuss it, you know what the other person thought about? They, this, this person carried this grudge around for their whole life and the other person never thought about them again, ever. It was, you, you understand? You, you get what I'm saying? It's like. I was in if I was the person holding the grudge. Do what? The driving the person holding the grudge, when he's holding the grudge against him, it didn't affect him. Anymore. He never thought about it again, right. you know? That's pretty common. Um, so, like he's saying there, you're holding that grudge, you're allowing him, they're tormenting you when they're not even thinking about it, right? Um, they're controlling you when God should be in control of you. And when God's in control of you, you can do this good stuff, right? Or you're more likely to do it. I'm not going to say you'll do it every time, but um, and that's kind of the point. Um, some of the probably most difficult things that I can think of uh, to forgive would be uh, when I see these people that uh, there was a lady, I, I can't remember now, her uh, daughter, I believe it was, was it, uh, it was either Harding or Freed. I, I think it's Harding. 
and she, and I've talked about this before, she, she was mur raped and murdered. And her mother began to write letters to the people that were convicted for doing it. And they actually became Christians. And I remember thinking, I don't know if I could do that. I think the best I could hope to do in that situation is not to hate them for the rest of my life. She went a step beyond and kind of gave us an idea of what can happen if you're willing to take that next step, right? Though I can't remember the two guys. They ended up uh, kind of becoming preachers in prison, and they basically preached to a pretty big group of guys there, and a bunch of them were baptized and became Christians. And the worst possible circumstance you can think of is what spurred it out what spurred it, brought it on, right? Reminds me a little bit of uh, Joseph. You know, there's there's that um, passage in Genesis where his brothers come back to Egypt and they're scared to death that he's going to kill them because they told everybody, sold him, in, made it, sold him into slavery and told his dad he was dead and he did all this horrible stuff to him. And, and uh, Joseph says, you meant this for evil, God used it for good. That's possible. I hope. I hope I never encounter anything like that in my life. But if it. But if it. But if I do, I hope I have the, the courage to. Uh, uh, try to let that go and see where. See what happens with it. I think that's it. Thank you, guys.